Do we have any questions? Okay, now we will start the public hearing. Thank you, Miss Octavia. Try this again. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I would like to comment on the budget. First of all, I would like to suggest that we have a big housing issue. We are not housing the 30%. We are not. We may be adding crumbs to the table, but we are not housing the 30%. So I am proposing that that brand new civic center, that uh, that civic building that we're planning on building on Dick's campus, I'm, I'm I'm recommending that we take $50 million for that and put it in that 30%. We've got to build 30% of the AMI. It is, it is ridiculous. Homelessness is a crisis. We are at a crisis. So I'm recommending that you take $50 million out of that great big civic center building you planning on building on Dick's campus, take it from that pot of money. Second thing, when Chief Dolan was our chief of police, he was big on teen centers. He was big on teen centers. He's the only police chief that had, in my own opinion, that had our kids in mind. He believed that there should be a teen center, center built all over the city. In this budget, I'm recommending that we build the next teen center and we build it in District D. District D don't have anything. So we have got to start looking at a teen center in District D. The teen center that's on Capitol Boulevard, my friend Dr. McTarran told me some horrible things. I am recommending that I don't know whether that teen center is open, but it needs to close. It needs to close because of some behaviors of the Raleigh Police Department that used that teen center as a search and frisk and did some terrible things. So I'm recommending that that center close, or if it's not closed, shut it down completely. I mean, it needs to be closed. I'm also recommending that on Newburn Avenue, in my neighborhood, that we build an SRO, Stormy, a single room occupancy at 30% or below of the AMI. We also build a day shelter with workforce included in the day shelter. We need to do better than what we're doing, and our homeless deserves better. So Stormy, I'm hoping you push this because you head up that task force, and that is one of the things that is really needed. I'm also recommending that there be a shelter in every district. Every district needs a shelter. Octavia, have you um, been to the county um, public sessions to speak out on this? Well, I'm planning on going to the county because I believe that this is really needed. I just tell the city, we have got to stop playing around with our homeless. I mean, it's a pitiful situation. Well, and the county has just started a study on the mm -hmm. needs, the shelters and whatnot. So maybe they could benefit from hearing from you. Well, That's what I, would I will. And I hope the city would join in because this is really crucial. Mm -hmm. Yes, we always partner with the county. Thank you. Demonte Crawford? Not here. Okay, um, Shane Collins? What's the song tonight? Okay, I'm going to ask to Danny Coleman, Nathan Spencer, James Benton, Lawrence Hickey, if you could come up behind them so we can move a little quicker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council and Mayor, for the opportunity to speak for neighborhoods and homeowners in regards to budget concerns moving into 2024. Um, in honor of Pride Month and a man named Mr. Rogers. I would like to talk about neighborhoods, affordable housing, the city budget, and helicopters. And I'd like to start with a song by Mr. Rogers. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for neighbors. Could you be mine? Would you be mine? So today, 
I'll start by saying thank you for addressing pay concerns for our emergency workers in Raleigh by budgeting 5% merit increases for public safety and general pay employees, as well as the living wage increases from 37,000 to 40,000, high upper 40,000 for all permanent full-time employees. Regarding citizen engagement, the city was able to collect resident preferences and priorities. Overall, the city received over 3,000 responses to its survey, a 275% increase from the prior year. It's amazing what you hear when you ask for people's opinions and thoughts about how they wish to be engaged. Common themes included affordable housing, transportation, safety, and community engagement. So it's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Could you be mine? Would you be mine? Mr. Rogers, again. In the budget again, key initiative uh, is working towards the annual go of 570 affordable housing units per year. We're not there yet. The city's not there yet. Um, completed projects in 23. Um, a lot of apartments um, and units. Booker Park South, Senior Project, Walnut Terrace, um, Primavera Senior. Um, all had apartments, um, single bedroom, multi-bedroom. Um, Gross Fenner Gardens had 62 apartments. But according to WRAL, the rents for these renovated apartments went up by 30%. I mean, these are people in apartments that they're having to pay higher rents now. So we've got more places, but the rents are going up. It's, so there's a, there's a bit of disconnect there. Um, and, and a lot of these developments included rental versus housing. Um, uh, in the budget, they, doggone. Thank you. Um, Danny Coleman was next, but he told me he was leaving. Is Danny, he left, he left. okay. Um, next we have Nathan Spencer. I'm disappointed we didn't get Danny. I like, I like hearing him. Um, I'm Nathan Spencer. I'm executive director with Wake Up Wake County. Um, I have to be honest. Uh, my my son and wife are at the pool right now, so I'm speaking and very jealous right now. So um, I'm not wearing a swimsuit though. Um, so anyway, I wanted to thank you all for uh, the work with the e-bike vouchers and um, what a great win with the DMV. Um, I'm really excited by what the future holds for the region and uh, the city and uh, uh, more selfishly District C. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit in my support for uh, and our support with from Wake Up in terms of the budget, um, specifically items around the fare free. Um, uh, I was in Costco the other day, and I, it hit me that uh, I have the luxury to go in and grab bulk items. Um, I have the space to keep them. I have this, the ability to go in every couple weeks. Um, the people who ride our buses, they're going to stores more frequently because they don't have the cash, the, the ability to do the Costco's, the BJ's, the supermarket, large buys. They're actually funding our $80 million Southern BRT route much more than I am because they're paying their sales tax much, much more in a higher percentage. So at this point, with our service not being as frequent, um, needing to increase that, with reliability being something we still need to work for, with um, uh, seven more years left in the Wake Transit Plan that we need to follow up on, I'm really proposing and really hoping, or not proposing, but supporting the idea of fare free. Um, for the next few years until we can get a system that is reliable and that people are not paying with their time. 
uh, when people are waiting and time away from being able to make money or being away from uh, their families, we're we're not doing them any good. We're they're paying in their time. So um, I plead with you to please keep that uh, fare free. I also wanted to um, take a moment to encourage more funding for affordable housing. I know we've got a lot in there for. Um, the affordable housing bond. I know that we've got the penny source. Um, I think you've heard quite a bit from folks about the fact that there's more need. We need to continue on this. And in future years, we need to talk about more general funds going to transit for operating and growth. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Next, we have James Benton. Is James here? Okay, I'm going to call out a few other names if we could come up. Um, we'll start with Lawrence Y E H L E. I'm sorry, um, I don't want to. Very close, Yaley. Yeah. Okay, then Matthew Cooper, Jockey um, Alea, um, Latanya Benton, and Cynthia Vinston. <clears throat> if you could all kind of line up over there, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Larry Yaley, uh, first of all, quickly, thanks for the extra time tonight. Um, the budget mentions uh, employees, equity, equitable, equitable community engagement oh. nearly 450 times, taxpayer, fiscal stewardship, expense reduction, benchmarking, productivity are mentioned only 11 times, actually taxpayers mentioned once. Uh, the proposed 10% property tax entirely attributed to the parks bond belies other year-to-year -year expense increases and offsets a favorable $18 million sales tax revenue increase. Also, the city view that it's balanced the budget fiscally belies its own actions to raise property taxes and usage fees. 40 positions were added in 2022, 39 in 2023. 32 ads are proposed for 2024, including five new management positions. That includes two new assistant directors. For example, a second director for 12 DEI employees is in fiscal stewardship, and claiming it's critical doesn't make it so. Organizational experts often consider 15 to 20 employees per manager as an ideal span of control. There are at least five departments with eight or fewer employees. Excessive overtime may also be a valid justification for more staff, yet as mentioned only twice in the fire department, likely non-exempts. A recent survey shows that nationally exempt overtime average is 20%, and there's no evidence that the city is managing a responsible level of overtime from all exempt employees as an alternative to more staffing. Foil, please. Slide, please. So slide. Uh, this is a benchmarking slide on uh, police salaries. There was no other benchmarking slides in the package, but this is what benchmarking looks like. Public safety is the city's first responsibility. RPD staffing, attrition, salaries, and benefits continue to be issues. I would remind people as far as public safety, we just had an active shooter in March near Lagan School. It's a timely reminder of the dangers faced by RPD and the importance of their public safety work. Most economists predict at least a mild recession coming with layoffs, hiring freezes already announced by major companies, Google, Amazon, and others. Except for public safety, fiscal stewardship warrants reconsidering the other additional headcount for 2025. Delay that decision. Look at New York City, San Francisco, et cetera, who have fallen financially and socially with tax and spend soft on crime policies. Challenge the city to do more with less. It's time for belt tightening and fiscal restraint. I'm available to discuss in more detail, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Matthew? Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Baldwin, City Manager, uh, Adams, David, and Councilors. I'm Matthew Cooper, uh, the President of the Raleigh Police Protective Association. Uh, we would first like to thank those who have spoken on our behalf in recent weeks. Their support helps sustain us. We would like to acknowledge that a 5% pay raise is a move in the right direction. However, if we have been consistently receiving these raises, we would not be in the situation we are in today. We are skeptical based on past experience of what to expect from an upcoming pay study. 
We would like the pay study to be inclusive and transparent. We need changes in our pay structure to show prospective officers and existing officers what they can expect to earn so they can adequately plan for their future with our department. Dozens of officers have left our department to work for agencies who have made strong commitments to, for compensation. We need a plan for sustainability and growth. We have a chief who knows the needs and challenges of our police department. If you do not give her the tools and resources to succeed, our department and city will suffer. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie? Good evening, Mayor Baldwin and council members. My name is Jackie Ayala. I'm the advocacy director with Habitat Wake. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment on the manager's proposed budget for fiscal year 24. Since 1985, Habitat Wake has built over 900 homes and over 600 of which were in, are in Raleigh. Uh, we're really pleased that the city has continued to dedicate local funding to the development and preservation of affordable housing. Yet the proposed fiscal year 24 budget doesn't go far enough to meet the, meet the need in our community. Additional local funding is critically needed to develop more subsidized affordable housing and to create more home affordability options for residents. Housing costs for Raleigh residents are expected to increase in fiscal year 24 due to the proposed rate hikes from Duke Energy and the proposed property tax increases from the city and county. Residents under 80% AMI will be disproportionately hurt by these increased housing costs. Construction costs have also gone up uh, by 25% specifically since 2020, so additional funding is needed simply just to keep up with the cost of construction. Specifically, the city should also dedicate funding to support residents with housing cost relief programs like energy assistance. With additional local dollars, the city could even expand the service area for the enhanced homeowner repair program, which is currently limited to residents along specific transit corridors. We hope that you'll consider increasing the general fund allocation for affordable housing in the final budget, and we thank you again for your time. Thank you. Um, Victoria. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Latoria Benton. Um, I am a resident of Raleigh and a hardworking mom of two. Um, I'm here before you today um, to implore you to continue to support more funding towards affordable housing in our community. I am a future home buyer with Habitat for Humanity Wake. Without that opportunity, me and my family, I don't know where we would be. Um, just a few years ago, a couple years ago here, um, I was forced to have to move out of our home of 15 years because it was bought by an investor who, you know, just wanted to rent out for a higher rent. So I had seven days to move and find a home. That wasn't pleasant for us. Having two young children, I can't even tell you how fortunate I feel because Partnering, partnering with Habitat Weight gave us an opportunity that a lot of people around me don't have. And it is because the funding and the availability is not there. Affordable housing continues to be an, an, an extremely important topic that doesn't seem to reach the top of anybody's list, and I don't understand why. It is obvious, and we can see that there is an affordable housing crisis and a rental market right here in Raleigh, is unattainable for a lot of people just to rent, you know? Why? What is the problem? Why can't we just say, we see the need, let's put it at the top of the list? Because if you don't have housing, we don't have stability. Um, and we don't have a lot of resources that can fill in the gaps that we need for our citizens here, our communities, our people. I heard someone say earlier that we'll, we're missing serving the people, and that is absolutely true. I've worked hard for many years in order to get in a position to purchase a home, but with the changes in the economy over the most recent few years, <clears throat> that finish line moved further and further away from me and my children. Thankfully, with the help and support from Habitat for Humanity, 
My children and I now have an opportunity to invest in a home and in our legacy. And I would like to quote Matthew Desmond that I heard recently. It's hard to argue that housing is not a fundamental human need. Decent, affordable housing should be the basic right for anyone in this country. The reason is simple. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. That's absolutely true. Thank you for your time, and thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Um, Cynthia? And if we could have Cole McMullen, Josh Bradley, Hua Huang, and Grant Bunn um, line up next, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cynthia Vinston, and I live at 832 Darby Street. And I've lived there for 22 years. I own a Habitat house. Um, I'm a single parent, well, was at the time. And I always dreamed of having that American dream and owning my own home. Um, when COVID hit, we were called the heroes, the first responders. So I'm asking you now to be the first responders for people like me of low incomes, that their incomes a year is less or almost $50,000 um, a year. They can't afford the big houses. In my neighborhood, for almost 19 years, nobody wanted to come to my neighborhood. My neighborhood was the dumping ground and still is the dumping ground for trash and debris. And when contractors do these buildings, they dump it in my neighborhood, on my street. But now you're coming over and you're building all these two hundred and $400,000 houses and apartments. And my neighbors that my children and I grew up with are losing their homes because the taxes have increased so much. It's not fair. And I'm asking you and begging you to have a heart. We need affordable housing. We need affordable housing. It's not a difficult thing. There are buildings that are empty that you can turn those in to affordable homes for us. You're clearing off all the other land. Why not give us that? Give us something. Show that you care. I voted for you guys. I depended on you guys to take care of us. I want to leave a legacy for my children. And I want other people like me to have that legacy. So I pray that you understand how it feels not to be able to afford health care or not to be able to buy groceries for your children or you sit and watch your children eat and you don't just to make sure that they get enough think about that. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Cole, Josh, Hua, and Grant. Uh, I'm opposed to the increase in the RPD budget from about $124.5 million to $131 million, uh, which is a 5.2 increase, despite the same budget document showing that there's been a 25% reduction in calls to RPD. Um, I would like to see the budget amended to bring funding for RPD down to $110 million at the most, uh, which is close to the actual amount spent during the fiscal years uh, 2020 through 2021 and 21 through 22. Um, I think that $21 million would be better spent on public services like public housing projects, targeting 0 to 30% AMI, uh, greater route coverage and frequency of Go Raleigh services, uh, and I, I think increased funding for law enforcement means
means increased enforcement of immoral laws like abortion bans, uh, no-knock warrants, which are often at the wrong address, any anti-LGBTQ plus bills that might make their way through the General Assembly, uh, and the failed war on drugs. Uh, these immoral laws shouldn't be enforced and should not be given an additional $21 million to enforce them. I'd also like to second what Ms. Rainey said uh, about instead of having a civic center using that $50 million roughly uh, targeting public housing projects at 0 to 30% AMI. Um, also, this might be a little petty of me, but I noticed there was $40,000 for Blue Ridge Corridor Alliance. I don't, I don't, and it was for economic development. I don't, I don't really trust that Blue Ridge Corridor, me personally, I don't trust that Blue Ridge Corridor Alliance, that that money would be best spent with them. I think, I know it's a small amount in a billion dollar budget, but I think it would be better allocated anywhere else. Um, finally, I like that there's a composting program study coming up in the budget. Um, there was something else I think I like, but I forget what it is at the moment. Right. Thank you. Josh. Josh Bradley, 1324 Spring Long Court. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of your time. I assumed that they were going to cram all the opponents into eight minutes. Thanks for not doing that. Um, a couple of things I want to speak on before I got, since I've got the three minutes. One of them is that there are people that think that evolution is, is not settled science, right? Because they always give an equal air time with the one scientist that oppose it and the 999 scientists that say there may be a God, but evolution happens, we see it. And that's what you do with these public hearings, given two people four minutes each and 30 people eight minutes normally. So I think I appreciate what y'all did giving people to speak because that actually brings it out. If people are really opposed or in favor of it, they should be lined up out here too. So... That's all I'm saying. Uh, and, and it comes to, I mean, you can give police folk raises, I guess, but just don't give them their department more money. Um, like, you can just budget what they have accordingly. You could pay officers more if they don't carry a gun. And it would be easier to uh, get more support for this if they didn't tend to randomly murder unarmed people. Um, it happens. It's happened here. I think it's something that, that you need to consider a, a, a majority unarmed police force, which would be probably cheaper, I would think. Um, so, yeah. Um, the city budget should be almost focused entirely on, uh, on housing. And I'm going to say workforce housing, low-cost housing. Affordable housing doesn't mean anything because rich people can afford a whole lot and it's affordable to them. The upperly mobile middle class makes a lot of money so they can have a house. It's not a problem. And any time, anything that we take away from that, that we put into parks, we put into policing, uh, that we're not putting into services is unfortunately a failure of our, 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 our city and ourselves as a society. Um, it's important um, that if you're really, if people are really concerned about public safety and crime, the only statistical thing shown to lower crime is making sure that people have housing and services. It's the only thing that's ever been shown to do that. More policing doesn't do that. It just ends up with more people in jail, and the more people in jail tend to be people that are black and brown and indigenous who commit a no more percentage of anybody else uh, in their um, in their their class bracket than any other folks. I don't know why there's so many since they are part, much less of the po percentage of the population. Um, so the real crime rate in this country hasn't really gone up at all since the 1960s um, overall when it comes to population. Um, so all this fear mongering that's coming about public safety and stuff um, is crazy. And another thing is if you really wanna solve like mass shootings and gun crimes, ban guns from white men. Uh, and other than that, uh, the people that come after me are preferred to, are preferred before me. So, thank you. Walk. Hi, I am here to speak against the city budget, and I'm gonna first to say that the refund rally members who will speak after me are gonna go in so much more detail on how the money should be spent instead of putting it into police. So I will give time for them to speak on that later on. I also wanna bring up a point that earlier, the city voted on an amendment to adopt resolution authorizing city manager to execute necessary instrument to donate service dog, basically helping a service dog from police um, to find a home. 
that's a very nice treatment. What are you doing the same for people who suffer mental health crisis? That's the thing to think about. Second, um, the I have the Wake County Housing Justice, Wake County Housing Justice Coalition has also poured through what was it, 400 pages of report as best to our ability that we can within the month that the report was posted on the website. And we were, we were also very concerned as to the many people who speak against the budget that um, this language around how much, how you're dedicating money to a low-income housing is, not in, is non-existent, if not vague. Um, and I will defer to, please refer back to what Ms. Octavia and everyone else has said about what you should be putting money, money toward. And speaking of vagueness, it's not a concern from the Housing Coalition. We noted that the city wants to allocate about $2.9 million to the Downtown Raleigh Alliance. We would like to know how that money has been used. We need that transparency on how Downtown Raleigh Alliance has been using the money that the city gives them. Is it going to a benefit in the community or just for lining pocket for private corporate interests? And then the last thing I want to bring up is the public engagement issue. The fact that like, the things that Ms. Octavia just talked about should be brought up months ago. The city should consider doing something along the lines of a, a public budgeting process that happens months in advance instead of just giving us a 400 page report a month before to review. Are people gonna have time to review all that? It's really difficult. Well, as opposed to like Durham, which I believe, look into it, Durham, I believe, gave the people part of money and, and asked the people, what would you do with this money? And just let the people decide. You have to put trust in the people. With the, this is money that coming from people's tax dollar. You should at least trust the people into deciding how to live and how to use that money. And that's why I'm calling for better public engagement, not just a three minute per person. I would, I would challenge you to go further, make it months in advance with the public budget process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Grant Bunn. And then I would like to ask Jenny McKinney, Zoe um, Niebuhr, uh, Marin Hurley, um, Laura Harris, and Lauren Frey to please um, line up. Hey all. Uh, my name is Grant. I live at Spanish Court and District D. Uh, I'm speaking today because Raleigh's crisis unit, ACORNS, should not be included in RPD's budget, but should be separately funded uh, in the interest of the public safety of our community. The Raleigh Police Department's budget has grown $21 million since 2020, and the proposed increase to nearly $131 million reveals misplaced priorities and does not reflect the needs of working class residents. Durham's HEART program, on the other hand, sends a mental health clinician, peer support specialist, and an EMT to crisis calls. And in their first 11 months, they've responded to over 6,000 calls and zero required police backup. The HEART program and also Denver STAR program are both great examples of well-functioning crisis units. And if you are committed to honestly addressing public safety, then you should remove police officers from ACORNS and establish funding that is distinct from RPD's budget. Thank you. Um, Jenny. Thank you. Um, so first, this also might be petty. Somebody else said they were being petty. Um, but I saw in the budget there was $0.5 million dedicated specifically to leapfrogging. So I did a quick Google. First thing that popped up is LAPD um, emergency vehicle operations prohibited practice leapfrogging. Hmm. This notice is to remind all sworn personnel that the emergency response driving technique, commonly referred to as leapfrogging, is prohibited. The practice of leapfrogging shall not be utilized when conducting emergency vehicle operations. Uh, training staff found this tactic to be a perishable skill that involves ongoing training in real world and street environments. The lack of formal and ongoing training combined with the public's expectation of safe emergency vehicle operations from law enforcement results in this practice being found to be unsafe. 
So there's $0.5 million that could go to uh, the HEART program. Um, so um, one thing about establishing that program is that you should allocate funding to uh, engage the public meaningfully. And that involves uh, also engaging people who are unsheltered to find out what ways this program could bridge the distrust that has been seeded by the city of Raleigh and by RPD. Uh, frankly, many of the institutions whose stated mission is to serve them have also broken that trust. Uh, I should know I worked for Salvation Army for two years. To the police unions uh, who consistently advocate for overinflation of the police budget, the money for your compensation has already been taken from taxpayers in misconduct, excessive use of force cases and settlements, like the recent one regarding a no-knock raid at the wrong address that terrorized two black families with children. So leapfrogging, proactive patrols, and uh, the use of tasers as a compliance tool as was done with Daryl Williams. Uh, these are all practices that have been demonstrated to be unsafe and or have a disproportionate impact um, negatively on minority, especially black communities. Um, and then Joshua, you rhetorically said you don't understand why there are so many black and brown people incarcerated compared to their population size. This is why. Uh, 2022 traffic stop data uh, that RPD reported to the state um, said that black individuals made up just 28.2% of Raleigh's population. In the same year, black individuals were 46.9% of the drivers stopped by RPD. They were 62.2% of the drivers searched, 66.4% of the drivers police reported using force against. That's why. And that's also why we need a non-law enforcement crisis response team. Thank you. The, the city manager would like to address um, the definition of leapfrogging and maybe explain that for some clarity. So Ms. McKinney, just for clarification, in our terms, leapfrogging is a human resources term in regards to somebody who's been in a position for a certain period of time, someone gets promoted over that person, it's called leapfrogging. It is truly about compensation, not any police tactic. Okay, um, Zoe um, Niebuhr. Good evening. My name is Zoe Niebuhr, and I, lived in, I live in District D on Kings Court. And I oppose this budget as it stands because of the amount of money allocated to the Raleigh Police Department. Um, it just continues the practice of addressing our housing and mental health crisis by throwing more money at police. I would like to see ACORN taken out of the RPD um, budget, and I would like to, to be independently operated. I'd like to see RPD headcount go down and hire social workers clinicians, and mediators instead. The Durham Heart Program is really leading the way. And although 24-7 service would be ideal, uh, out of 6,000 calls, not a single one of them required police to be called. So there is no excuse for us to be putting more into police headcounts when we could be investing into a mental health crisis response unit that is independent from the police. I also want to ask the council, what are the plans on doing community engagement to establish this independent mental health crisis unit? Thank you. Thank you. Marin Harley. Good evening. My name is Marin Harley. My pronouns are she, her, and I am here to oppose the proposed budget. The needs of our community have not changed since we were here last year asking for the essential and deeply needed policies like living wages for city workers, affordable housing, quality public transportation, and a mental health crisis response team that does not include police. These necessities have not been met and the ACORNS program is insufficient to make our community safe. The data and the people reflect what we already know. Investing in police is not a solution to mental health crises. We know personally, and the studies corroborate, that police do not protect us from mass shootings or lower violent crime rates. Rather, police exacerbate mental health crises, abuse our houseless neighbors, and continue to murder and terrorize communities of color, particularly Raleigh's black community. 
Investing in police is only an investment in violence and brutality. I stand with Refund Raleigh's demand for a crisis response and support team modeled after the Durham Heart Program. After more than 400 mental health calls to the Heart Program, none needed police involvement. The city of Raleigh has the opportunity to meaningfully invest in the safety and well-being of Raleigh communities. The only way that this program can be successful is if it abandons reliance on police and instead centers community both in the development of the crisis response program and in the employment of peer support specialists from the communities it will serve. Raleigh deserves more than this cowardly budget and it is the community that should be deciding how public money is spent. We ask you to join us in creating a safer and more equitable Raleigh. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Harris. Is Laura here? You come up, please. And then um, Lauren Frey. Hello, my name is Laura Harris. I live in District D. Thank you, Councilmember Jones, for the extra time. I've read one author describe the effects of racism and criminalization in terms of violence upon the black body. That really stuck with me because it's a very concrete image of a beautiful human body full of life, standing tall, and then suddenly, tragically, fallen and riddled with bullets and blood. Of course, this is one of the most extreme forms of violence, and this comparison fails to mention the myriad other forms of violence that are inflicted upon the bodies of black people in this country, often starting in childhood. But it does highlight the complicity of the city of Raleigh in the perpetuation of said violence with their current budget proposal, and it's not something we should accept sitting down. Raleigh needs a 24-7 crisis response program independent of the police and run by members of the community. Additionally, more money needs to be allocated toward affordable housing. There's city-owned property downtown, right next to Moore Square Park. They could put 30% AMI housing there and a day shelter, but the city just wants to make money and gentrify and drive homeless folks from downtown. It's not too late, council members, to choose the right thing and choose a new plan for Moore Square. Thank you. Lauren Frey. And then if we could have Liv um, Highfill, Eleanor Ross, Mansu Chita, Isis Wilson, and Elisa Chapman line up, please. My name is Lauren Frey, and I'm a resident of Raleigh. I'm here today to speak out against the allocation of $130 million for the Raleigh Police Department and in support of funding living wages for city workers, affordable housing, quality public transportation, and a mental health crisis response team that is completely unaffiliated with the police. Currently, Raleigh's ACORNS program functions as an extension of the Raleigh PD and does not serve the needs of the community. Raleigh PD has a long history of being incapable of adequately responding to situations involving mental health issues. As recently as last year, Raleigh PD murdered two Raleigh residents who were in crisis. I stand in solidarity with Refund Raleigh's demands for a crisis response and support team modeled after initiatives like Denver's STAR program or Durham's HEART program. These are independent teams that respond to crisis calls without criminalizing people who need help. And as part of this team, we need meaningful community involvement, including peer support specialists from the communities that they are serving. The people of Raleigh deserve to have their resources spent on programs that actually create safety rather than brutality and fear. Divest from Raleigh PD and invest in the Raleigh community. Thank you. Liv Highfield. Is Liv here? Okay. No, no. um, Eleanor Ross. Council, Mary Ann, my name is Eleanor Ross, and since you took away my public comment slot, I am going to be giving both my public comment and my public hearing now. Um, so I would like to address the Council on the proposed sale and redevelopment of city land around Moore Square and their lack of transparency on it. 
The city issued a request for proposals and voted on them last year when only half of the current council members were in office. The proposal selected was from Loden Properties, a company that's gentrifying Glenwood South and a host of other areas around the Triangle. We also submitted a proposal. Talk about providing solutions to issues, we gave you a whole proposal and it had drawings and everything. I'd like to know why that proposal was not chosen. I would like to know why not a single city council member even reached out to us to talk about it. The proposal includes ideas for combating homelessness, safety issues, mental health problems, the downtown food desert, and unemployment, all with those little plots of land. Kind of feels like you want solutions from the people until they give you some that you don't like. So, we got, er, so tell me why no one on the city council was even a little bit interested to discuss it further. We got unresolved public records requests and 90 seconds for a public comment. And meanwhile, the residents of the brownstones near Moore Square, many of whom live there only part time, got a private party with Marianne to complain about the homeless in Moore Square. Homeless people are not the issue. Homelessness is, and so is the city's failure to address it. But now that can change. Stop pandering to developers, stop privatizing downtown, and stop sipping drinks with quasi-residents of Raleigh on what used to be Black Main Street while homeless people 500 feet away piss themselves due to lack of public facilities. New counselors, I urge you to look into this proposed redevelopment. Per the RFP, at least part of the project can be canceled by the city up until the sale of land. Stand up for your people and invest in the community. A great opportunity for this is the crisis response team as proposed by Refund Raleigh. Earlier you mentioned exploring a fully civilian crisis response team. This is great to hear, but I want to emphasize the need for peer support specialists as done in the Durham Heart Program. This program can only be successful if those who need it are comfortable utilizing it. I've been going out to Moore Square every week or two on Sundays to serve free food to people for three years now and have become familiar with a lot of the people and situations down there. And before even hearing of the HEART program and peer support specialists, I came to that same conclusion that Raleigh's crisis response team should include those in the most in-need populations. Why? Because they're already doing it. They're already addressing crisis situations in their community. They already know the most basic rule of de-escalating crisis situations, which is don't bring a gun into it. So employ them, organize them, give them resources. This can be done as part of the HEART program, and I ask the council to include funding it in this year's budget. Um, Mansour Chima. Yeah, a greeting. My name is Manzoor Chima. I'm resident of 4108 Archie Baldwin in Raleigh. Uh, greeting uh, Mayor Baldwin and Raleigh City Council members. I'm a member of Muslims for Social Justice and People's Power Lab. We represent black, brown, and Muslim working class community members in Raleigh and surrounding cities. Many of our members are unemployed, underemployed, lack health insurance, suffer mental health crises, food insecurity, housing insecurity, substance abuse, and other oppressions. We reject this budget since it does, it does little to help the impacted people. Uh, we are especially opposed to the bloated police budget that does little, that does not offer any help to our community members, doesn't offer security and safety to our people. We want Raleigh to follow the example of Durham Heart Program and invest in non-police uh, program for responding to crisis. We specifically demand that you should implement Refund Raleigh's uh, imp uh, proposal for the crisis response team, which will be led and guided by people in the community who are closest to the people who are building the movement with the impacted people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Isis Wilson. Is Isis here? She's not here. Okay, um, Alyssa Chapin. My name is Alyssa Chapin. I am a resident of the city of Raleigh, and I am here today to support the crisis response program similar to that of Durham's Heart Program. <sighs> It feels necessary to remind the council that everyone has somewhere to be. It feels necessary to say that you all were voted into office to spend your time here while people are leaving their families and their jobs to be here. Your concern for your own time undercuts and disenfranchises the democratic process. We thank you for your consideration of the crisis response team that is unaffiliated to the Raleigh Police Department, but your consideration simply means that there is more work to do. 
This is work that must be done with very clear ways for the community to be involved in its development. Last year, we, became, we came before you and we asked that the same basic needs be met. We asked for a living wage for city workers and a right response team that could address mental health crises without police presence. Our asks remain the same of such a crisis response team because the data and the people who supporting this program consistently also are showing up and asking for this. Durham's HEART program, similar to the program that we are asking you to, to implement, has reported that responders feel safe in 99% of its encounters and 0% of calls needed police department backup for team safety. We must also insist that you include community with the creation of this program that includes compassionate peer support and guidance from people who are from the communities most in need. We know that Raleigh can afford this program because you have 130 million of our own dollars that you are using to bankroll the police department. As we continue to pay our tax dollars, we ask that you consider something other than violent, the violent status quo that normalizes police killings of the most vulnerable in our community. We ask that you be brave as we dream and we build new worlds. Thank you. Could we have Charlie Burnett, Nikki Williams, Bria Perry, Anganza Laughing House, and um, Ajimu Dillahunt, please line up. We'll start with Charlie Burnett. Is Charlie Burnett here? Okay, then we will go with Nikki Williams. Good evening, my name is Nikwe Williams, and I will begin with, um, by reciting a prayer. Ever-present God, you called us to be in relationship with one another and promised to dwell wherever two or three are gathered. We are here today to ask that you enable us to see the reality of racism, challenge it, and uproot it from our city. Surrounded by violence and cries for justice, we hear your voice telling us, do not fear, for I am with you. As you stand with us, God, strip away the brutality that harms black and brown lives so that we may see peace and justice in our communities. We place our hopes for safer, thriving communities in your hands. In faith we pray, amen. 130 million of our taxpayer dollars are being allocated to a department known for its brutality against the most vulnerable in our city. The Raleigh Police Department's budget has received an increase of $21 million since 2020. Our community did not ask for an investment in police violence. We demanded meaningful forms of community safety, including a livable wage for city workers, affordable housing, quality public transportation, and a mental health crisis response team with no police. ACORNS is inadequate and does not meet the needs of our people to feel safe. Instead, ACORNS function as an extension of the Raleigh PD. While the community led the charge for a crisis intervention unit, the city responded by not only excluding the community from the process. Moving forward, how will city council members prioritize community input and incorporate the remarks from tonight's hearing into the development of the independent crisis response unit? I didn't see nobody write the question down. Let me repeat it. How will city council members prioritize community input and incorporate the remarks from tonight's hearing into the development of the independent crisis response unit? The city manager is working on that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Bria Perry. Hello, uh, my name is Bria, and I have been a resident of Raleigh since I was born. And I am here to oppose the budget move to increase the police budget by more than 5% from the last fiscal, fiscal year. 
Reform Raleigh is a collective of young people in Raleigh who has been demanding that this city divest from police violence and invest in real programs of community safety that provide our people with the things we need to thrive. That is why we are demanding a mental health crisis response unit that is independent from the police. We also value censoring the voices of those who are most impacted by the issues we organize around. As a black queer woman who has, who has experienced various mental health struggles for nearly half my life, I am someone who has been directly impacted by this issue. So instead of repeating the compelling facts and statistics that have been shared by my comrades before me, I'm gonna get a little personal. When I was in college, a time where I, was consist where I consistently found myself in crisis, a well-meaning friend decided to ask the police to conduct a wellness check on me after not being able to get in contact with me for a few weeks. When the police arrived at my door, not only did their mere presence escalate the anxiety attack that I was in the middle of, they also barged into my living space and turned it upside down while hounding me with questions as if I was being accused of a crime and not someone who was in a vulnerable position and in need of care. The only reason they ended up leaving was because my neighbors just so happened to be passing by and advocated for me. Were it not for them, I might not have made it out of that interaction alive, especially considering how vulnerable I am to state-sanctioned murder as, once again, a black queer woman. I share that story to emphasize that it is community that keeps us safe, not police. As we push for you all to put our money, need I remind everyone in this room that this city's budget is funded by our tax dollars. As you put your, our money where your mouth is in your, in your support of establishing a mental health crisis, crisis response unit, independent from the police, we implore you to, to prioritize meaningful community involvement in this program by incorporating peer support specialists from the communities they are serving. My experience in college taught me that we are truly the only ones who keep us safe, who protect each other, who support each other and give each other care, while the police only find more ways to intimidate and seek violence on us when we are in crisis. Our neighbors just 20 miles away in Durham is accomplishing exactly what we're pushing for here. We have the same power, we have the same resources, we have the same time that they do. All we need is the will. I hope you all have the will. Thank you. On Gaza Laughing House. And then after that, Ajumu Dillahunt. Peace, everybody. Hey, thank you for the time. My name is Ngaza Laughing House. It's good to be here. And I know you guys know there are countless studies that talk about uh, crime and how to prevent crime, criminological and sociological studies. And they talk about how jobs and living wages, about how education and housing all serve to prevent crime in urban areas. And I think that each one of you guys understands that. I've seen some of you working for years and years in the city, and I want to believe that you're trying to do your best. But when I look at this city budget, and I see over the past three years, you've increased the housing and neighborhood department's budget by just two million, but the police budget in these past three years has gone up $21 million. It makes me question whether or not you're really trying or just talking. Now, when I read this budget, man, I can imagine, just think about it. If you had invested $21 million into the affordable housing, where would we be right now after three years? If you invested $21 million into the ACORN program, into mental health, where would we be right now when this imbalance continues every single year? You cautiously sprinkle money in the programs for the people, but you'll dump money into the police budget. Even though RPD, its own statistics, its own facts, show that the traffic stop data. They're searching black folks two times more than they search white folks. They're searching, they stopping black folks, uh, I mean searching black folks seven times more than they do white folks. Stopping black drivers twice as much, using force against black folks seven times as much, and y'all turn around and give them a reward each year by increasing their budget. Five million every single year. 21 million in three years. This makes no sense. Now some of you, who I love, man. I've seen y'all working hard, the course correct, coming here, bringing new energy, trying to steer this ship right. We appreciate you. We want to continue to collaborate with you. But for those of you who have been on this council for years, every year you see these trends and you vote for a budget that increases this police spending and give us lip service about housing while not funding housing, we got to start calling you out. We got to start calling you out. And it's not because we dislike you. 
it's because we have to break this pattern that you would leave us stuck in. So that's what we're doing today. We appreciate y'all who are on our side, and I love each one of y'all too. Thank y'all. I think, and brother, if we God. could have Leon um, Cook up, Martha Hernandez, and Griselda Alonzo following. Um, thank you. Yeah, I think Brother Ngaza uh, really shared what needed to be shared, and I almost don't want to share my remarks, but I'm going to proceed. Uh, but as someone born and raised in Raleigh who still lives in Raleigh, uh, I come to the meeting today frustrated uh, because we are behind. Uh, and though the comments by the city manager uh, about uh, the research going into the Durham Heart Program is very encouraging. Uh, it's still frustrating. Yesterday, I had a chance to attend a Durham City Council meeting, uh, and they're not just talking about the success of the Heart Program. They're expanding it. They're going from 12 staff to 24 staff members. And I just asked, what are we, what are we doing? And again, I hear what the city manager has said, but what are we doing? And at the community press conference uh, before uh, the actual city council meeting, four city council members came to speak in support of the expansion of the HARP program. And one city council member who is a professionally trained social worker uh, and who's on faculty at North Carolina Central University, the number one historically black college in the country, she, she talked not only in support of the HARP program, she talked about how she's taking students from the social work program at North Carolina Central University to volunteer for the HARP program, to work for the HARP program, and is incorporating that in incorporating that into this curriculum. So I ask, when we talk about resources and we talk about dealing with a problem, we talk about funding the ACORNS program, Independent of the Police, we have NC State with a strong social work program. We have a number of universities uh, in this area who can contribute to that. The responsibility of the university in the first place is to take its knowledge from the campus and use it in the community. And I guess it's, it's one thing, and again, it's great that the um, uh, city intern is going to the hearts program, but as we're developing uh, this heart program, I, I, as we're developing the ACORNS program independent of the police, I think it's important to note the community element, element to it. Durham has a community safety department. An entire community safety department is responsible for community safety, and that's what the HEART program lives under. And so we've researched this. We've looked at Denver Star program. And so we're simply saying that you cannot have a program for the community uh, that the community is not a part of. In Durham's HEART program, an another element, they're expanding from 12 staff people to 24, uh, and they're not raising the taxes in Durham. And so it's possible, but we have to get creative and we have to think together, not only from a city level, but from a community level. So as someone born and raised in Raleigh and who believes that the real 919 is Raleigh, you know, I went to school in Durham, it's great. But I think we should be leading the way. We should be taking a step further. We shouldn't let Durham be this far ahead of us by not only providing data. I mean, they're tracking the program, so there's really no excuse. We shouldn't be just letting Durham lead the way. We should be joining uh, and doing a little healthy competition to do what's best for our people and our community. Thank you. And, and I, I, I would like to, as a professionally trained historian, I would like to give you pamphlets on the history of if, the Raleigh Police if you Department. Could I think hand it's found to the um, clerk, please. Thank you. Um, Leon Cook. Then Martha Hernandez, and then um, Griselda Alonso. I'd like to thank the speakers who were here before me. I feel humbled um, by their dedication and their interest in making this a better city. Uh, I think it should be taken up by all that's uh, sitting at that table. You say that you are for affordable housing. What is your definition of affordable? 100% my AMI is affordable if you have the means, as is 80%. However, when we are supposed to be talking about affordable, we should be talking about 40 and 30 or below AMI. I think it should be called, instead of affordable housing, low-income housing, so that you understand that it's not for those at 80%. You give developers a pass on providing affordable units in their products under the guise of a state assembly ruling. You fought for election rules to benefit you, 
but you won't fight for residents who are in need of housing. They may throw a few units at 60% AMI and feel good about it. We don't. The budget does not adequately provide for affordable housing despite the $80 million bond issue. The Parks bond is $250 million. Apparently, Dix Park and Smoky Hollow Parks are more important than making sure that our residents are properly and affordably housed. The small amount allocated for rehabbing naturally occurring housing gets the job done. What is being done about it doesn't get the job done, I apologize. A multi-year wait for renovations is causing people to abandon or sell their property to developers. Oh, the proposal to fund refund e-bikes, really? <laughs> Providing up to 75 units is really going to put a dent in people getting around. Many can barely make the increased property taxes imposed on them, if at all. And you want them to purchase an e-bike, even though it's funded, federally funded, that program? Why not make all of the budget money appropriated for the e-bikes available to low-income residents and not subsidize those at 80 and 100% AMI brackets? As to Dick's Park, why not spend funds to modernize some of the existing buildings to provide for the mental health services since it was moved out and there is so much more need for it at this time? Also, accommodating many of the homeless should also be a priority to support your concern for our lesser well-off neighbors. On a subject, another subject, with all the annexation cases, particularly the recent Z1620. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. Um, Martha Hernandez and then Griselda Alonso. Is Martha here? And Griselda? Um, Martha and Griselda both had to leave, but they were both Spanish speakers. And we have a translated statements from both of them. Is it possible for me to recite those or to send them to staff? Do you have anything written that you can provide to us? Yeah, I can speak it and provide it. Can I? Rules of decorum don't allow that, but I'm going to say, OK, you've translated this? Yes. OK. Do I get six minutes? Or was it three? For two, three, three. I'm sorry. Three. Okay. It's a shame that you want to allocate an extra $10 million to the police when there are other necessities our communities don't have. Wouldn't you think that prevention programs should be our priority because they are the strongest way to build safe neighborhoods? Crime, preve crime prevention is not equipping the police with more and more money in arms. The better way of using our money is to avoid the evictions of hundreds of families that may be affected by the gentrification that we are experiencing, experiencing, experiencing mainly in South Raleigh. With this money, we could create spaces for parks, recreation, affordable and free learning opportunities with our children. With this money, we could be preventing young people, unemployed, folks from being victimized by systems of criminalization that primarily target our communities of color. As our representatives and members of our community, you should be looking out for all of our well-being, not conspiring to fill prisons for crimes that you could be preventing by investing in resources for our community. As a human being and taxpayer, I am here to ask you all that my tax dollars be put towards mental health resources, education resources, parks and recreation, and housing for communities of color. I want to share with you that communities have mental health issues because of a lack of resources. Using armed police who are totally unprepared to deal with this problem is a fatal combination. If you don't want more innocent blood on the hands of your police, you must direct more money to, prevent, to prevention, prevention and less money to jails and weapons. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I am going to now close the public hearing. Um, this will come back to us on the 12th, right? Okay, the 12th. Okay, and I'm going to ask that we take a 10 minute break, walk around a little bit, but be back here in 10 minutes. <laughs>